All right, today we got the long-awaited arrival of Isaac Weissup. How are you, man? Good. How you doing, man? Dude, man, doing good. Glad to have you. Uh, this has been a long time coming. You ghosted me for years. You didn't want anything to do with the confessionals, and here you are, coming and begging for mercy. No. <laughs> hey, it's kind of like that, though. Good. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, you, you know, and you know what this is like in this sort of business realm. I get a lot of messages on all the platforms and DMs and comments and emails. And man, I don't know how, but I, I, th I blame it on Gmail. I think they put it in my, you know, the like social folder or promotions folder. Yeah. Uh, I, I recall that being the thing because it was a strange windy road of how we got linked up. Uh, the thing that sparked it was uh, Demi from Thoughtful Dot. She, she does the mandala, hand-painted mandalas. She was. She sent me an episode where you interviewed a guy who went out into the Mojave Desert and witnessed a lot of strange activity. And she said, "Oh, you got to listen to this episode." And and I don't, I don't consume a lot of podcasts because you, you know I'm busy. I just I'm reading books and trying to prepare my own shows. And it was a fascinating story. And I ended up listening to the whole thing. I said, "Wow, that was that was interesting because I've got a lot of research into the desert and." secret societies and cults and satanists and all that stuff and it kind of hit on all those things and we could talk about that later here in a minute but um yeah that's when i said wow that's really interesting i'm gonna look this uh this show up a little bit more and i don't remember what what happened i think i followed you on instagram and then it showed me that you had messaged me and i said oh crap this guy had messaged me and then i look on my email and there was another message and i said oh my god i'm such a jerk man i, I just didn't i didn't catch it and i think it's because all the platforms had funneled the email to like requests and social fo folders and things like that so anyway yeah. I, I am i am begging for your mercy and i thank you very much for letting me on your show yeah man no it's actually it's nice to have you say that because uh it happens to me a lot too one you and i were just talking about how my wife does my emails and stuff and things still slip through the crack because it just does i mean i ha i'm we're juggling like probably 10 email accounts and it, it, for different things and sometimes people email you know merkel media for an experience that they had that should be going to the confessionals podcast and then sometimes people dm us and we don't check the dms a whole at least i don't i don't check the dms a whole lot and so uh every once in a while i get an email it's like you know you're a real jerk you know i emailed you i'm like listen man. like that's a great way to get on the show for sure <laughs> so yeah well uh, and people don't understand it's more than a full-time job because if you respond to every message those people are also going to write you back and yes. and add that to the new messages and it's yeah it's difficult it's not easy when you're not joe rogan who's probably got a team of people who just comb through emails all day or whatever yeah it's the ripple effect man i mean it's the, it really is i mean we we throw pebbles out in the water and the ripple effect takes over and it covers a lot of ground and so that 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 comes back to us uh, like I, I always talk about that stuff when like the ripple you know, you see it hit go out into the water, but then it comes back and that's the emails. They come back and they come back in a bigger way than you sent out. <laughs> right, uh, right. Yes. So yeah, it, it gets busy, but uh, you brought up a, a great launching point for the conversation here. Uh, we did do that Joshua Tree episode and I actually did a sequel in the sense that there was another guy named James who uh, was stationed at 29 Palms and he had an experience and this was a member show but uh, he had an experience where uh, he was in charge of a group of guys that were getting ready to get kicked out of military. I guess they were in kind of like a holding pattern. They're not out yet, but they're going to be kicked out just waiting to process the paperwork. And uh, there was this one guy that was really strange. And uh, there's a lot of different things that went into it. But one of the things uh, that he talked about was how he went to this guy's, I guess this guy lived off base or something like that, but him and a couple other guys went to where this guy lived to pick him up because he didn't show up one day. And there were people in the house that were calling this guy they were picking up father and he called them his children. And he asked them, or he, at another time he asked this guy I was talking to to drive him out to a party in Joshua Tree. And he said when he drove him out to the place where this guy was going to be at this party, he said it looked like a giant rave, just like the other James uh, described. And he described a lot of similar things. And the guy said, do you want to stay? And he's like, nah, this isn't my scene. 
And uh, then after we were done doing the interview, this actually, this is breaking news. Uh, I actually sent him the coordinates of where this happened. And uh, he's like, that's exactly where I took him. So I, I know this is a repeatable thing in the sense that uh, I have two people who have been to this location talking about this weird party in the desert. And uh, it, it was a popular show. People really, really seem to like the uh, the story and were taken back by it. Uh, I'm interested to hear maybe some of your thoughts on these things as far as uh, I know you said you do a lot of research on, you know, the Mojave Desert. Uh, I had no idea there was ever even a, like an occult connection to these locations until I had that interview. So uh, feel free to educate us a little bit as to what you know about these topics. So the desert is because what, what I focus on mainly is the, I, I, you know, it's the occult, which is a Latin term that means hidden. A lot of people get confused when they, they first enter this realm and they think I'm talking about cults like, uh, you know, Jonestown or Waco and, and that, not quite the same thing, right? It's, it's more to do with philosophies, religions, and ideas that some people would call antinomian, meaning it, it sort of goes against the social norm and the social norm in America and, and a lot of the world obviously is Christianity. So, Oftentimes, it's a lot of anti-Christian uh, religions that I'm looking at. And the real question, and I don't have the answer to it yet, is what's the level of truth behind some of these occult teachings? Because a lot of them, you'll find, get into the realm of New Age thinking. And I actually am okay with a lot of New Age thinking. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, yoga and meditation. And, and these are all things that that strengthen the mind. But you can take it to a realm of uh, going too far. And what we're talking about here is kind of best exemplified through the ideas of ritual magic, which, uh, you know, it's manifesting a, a, new, a reality based upon your beliefs. And there's white magic and there's black magic. And black magic is where it's gone too far. And that's when uh, you're trying to change the world and to uh, satisfy your ego. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to lay that out there and then let's move into the desert talk. So in terms of the occult, the, one of the ideas is to establish a set and setting. This is what a lot of people do when they go on hallucinatory trips with psychedelics and stuff, right? And one thing you'll find is a setting of the desert is a great place to do these things. It's a place for initiation. You can read, a, a lot of people take sort of pilgrimages out there seeking spiritual experiences, and you'll, you'll find this oftentimes. And if you read, uh, there's a popular book called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, and in the book he talks about how the desert is the greatest teacher that we have. And Paulo Coelho, I wrote a book about <laughs> about The Alchemist and about Paulo Coelho. He was a follower of Aleister Crowley back in the, I think it was the 60s, before he wrote this book, The Alchemist. And uh, do, does your audience are they familiar with Aleister Crowley? I imagine they would be, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least in the in the, I I'm, I think most of my audience probably is not for Aleister Crowley, but I know they're familiar. I'm sure. Okay, yeah. So Aleister Crowley, a very famous occultist. Uh, we don't need to go too deep into it, but uh, he's he's painted as the real boogeyman of the occult. <laughs> and what he did was he kind of synthesized a lot of beliefs, a lot of previous occult beliefs, and uh, dare I say popularized it, you know, the Beatles infamously put him on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's and, and so on. Right. But that's a whole show in itself, but you'll find a lot of odd things that connect us in with the desert. You've got the Trinity site where they conducted the first nuclear test. And if you look that up, there's actually a black monolith that they, they erected on the site where they did this. And we'll we'll talk about Jack Parsons because he plays a role in this. I don't want to I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole. I want to stick to the idea of the deserts and the Mojave. Um, but you know Charles Manson, he's a topic I've studied a lot. He took his whole family out there to teach him these occult principles of the desert and universal consciousness and and a lot of these themes that you'll hear often in, in New Age occult thinking. Another example would be that uh, Stephen Greer. 
he's that very famous i don't know if you call me ufologist at this point but he's very it's, much it's a summoner <laughs> yeah he he teaches people he he teaches people how to channel aliens and ufos and he does this out in the desert why is this well i don't know why the desert is the initiatory place but jack parsons who is arguably as famous as alistair crowley he was a guy who and, and let me give you a five second spiel on him for people who don't know who i'm talking about back in the 30s and 40s he was basically the guy who made rockets useful for the American military. Uh, he, at the time, there were German Nazi scientists trying to make the V2 rocket happen. And in America here, we had these sort of opposing scientists trying to also make a rocket happen. And Jack Parsons was the guy who did that. And they started, uh, he established Jet Propulsion Laboratories, JPL. A lot of people say that's the the uh, initials for Jack Parsons, but it's neither here nor there. But they established JPL, which would pave the way for NASA. Okay, and then when you get into NASA, you've got, of course, all these ideas of secret outer space things and going to the moon. Did we go to the moon or not? All these things, right? So, anyways, Jack Parsons, while he was a rocket scientist, he was also an occultist, and he followed the works of Aleister Crowley and pursued a lot of these efforts. Well, back in 1946, he went out to the Mojave Desert and channeled an entity. And this entity, they called the, uh, the I don't know how you pronounce it, but the v Venusian uh, from the planet Venus, allegedly. And this is from Jacques Vallée, who's a very famous ufologist. He said that this was how it went down. But Jack Parsons, he was out of the desert and he channeled this Venusian entity. And this entity dictated to him an entire book and jack parsons wrote it all down it's called lever 49 or the book of babylon and this is important in the history of alistair crowley because alistair crowley similarly channeled an entity called awas to write the uh, the book of the law which is basically the occult sort of bible for this new age that he was trying to bring about and then jack parsons wrote supposedly the denouement to the to the uh the book of the law the fourth book and when he was out in the mojave desert he was out there with l ron hubbard l ron hubbard of course the founder of scientology and what they were doing was they were using a form of alistair crowley's magic rituals because alistair crowley again you know and and i, I i'm, I'm kind of talking slow because i'm trying to i'm trying to find the right depth because i don't want the audience to tune out and be like i don't know who he's talking about uh alistair crowley in around 1917 he did a, a similar ritual called the amalantra working in new york and he channeled an, an entity called lamb l-a-m which means the path and lamb if you look at if you if you search the image you'll see that lamb is basically the first gray alien, first depiction of a gray alien. Big head, big eyes. Uh, I, I think it didn't even have a mouth. So arguably, he made contact with an alien in 1917 using the Amalantra working. Now, what's interesting is that this Amalantra working was based upon Enochian magic. Enochian, <laughs> Enochian magic, um, it goes way back. I, I'm trying to set up a precedence for there's a long history of occultists trying to make contact with entities. Uh, and one place they can make contact is the desert. That's what we're trying to get at here. But Enochian magic was established by John D and Edward Kelly. in I think it was around the 1500s. They made contact with some entities and those entities said, Hey, here's the language, write this down. This is the language with which you can, you could speak to us. And they wrote it down on this grid and Alistair Crowley would, would sort of use that language to make contact. And then Jack Parsons used the same language to make contact on the deserts of the Mojave. And it's called the Babylon workings is the name of the ritual that he did with L Ron Hubbard. And we can go into detail on it. I don't want to go off, off the deep end on you here, but he did this ritual to summon the Scarlet woman, the whore of Babylon, they call her with the purpose of bringing about the apocalypse, which just means the revealing. It wasn't like he did it so that uh, he would trigger a you know giant nuclear holocaust. He did it 
to bring about a goddess that they named Babylon because he thought that she would be the key for mankind to have the revealing and change the world as we know it. And this is a very specifically anti-Christian perspective because Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley, they both looked to Christianity as an oppressive control system. So they did this ritual and he in fact meets a redheaded woman named Marjorie Cameron. And then, you know, the story goes deeper here, there and everywhere. But the point being to sum it all up, when we see things happening in the desert, there's a long, rich history of occultists using magic rituals that are sort of proven going back to the 1500s and even earlier, if you want to get into, uh, you know, the ideas of alchemy in the book of Thoth and all these sort of different outlandish ideas for people who don't study this. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> basically, basically there's rituals to make contact with entities and the desert is a place in which they would do that. So to hear the story that your, uh, your guest had relayed about going out of the desert and seeing some very strange activity. I mean, it, it makes total sense to me. And that's why I was like, this is fascinating that someone actually witnessed this happen. So, yeah. So the, it, first of all, this is really fascinating because, uh, I, uh, you and I are two different worlds colliding. Uh, you do a ton of research. I do next to none. I collect people's stories and and talk with them about their experiences. And now it's like the things you're studying and you, now you've heard somebody's story that they've experienced what you've been studying. It can be mind-blowing. Uh, you mentioned about the en Enochian magic. Um, and I would like to... This is, th this is really more clarification than anything um how do you spell enochian because years ago and this might be an episode you want to check out too i had a guy on uh, it was episode 122 and i called it secret uh secret military uh enochian technology i think is what i called it secret military mm -hmm. enochian technology and i said enochian but he said enochian but I, I didn't know what a Nokian was. I still don't. But uh, I, I said, I think you mean an Enochian because in the story, he he was in the military and he was sent on a, on a mission that had a lot of trippy stuff happen. Uh, but he was they were to go retrieve a downed aircraft. And they spent days going through, I, I don't know if it was jungle or what, he wouldn't tell me where this was. But when they arrived on scene, he said it was a craft that he's never seen before. Uh, when they got inside, his job was to ret retrieve data, retrieve information off this thing. And when he got inside, the the language that was written all over, he didn't recognize. So he's going through his like manual, trying to figure out what this is even saying. And a scientist came over to him because they had a team of scientists with him. Uh, but a scientist had come over to him and said, you're not going to find that language in there. And he kind of brushed him off like, whatever, dude, like, let me do my job. And then the, the scientist doubled down, slammed his hand down on his book and said, you're not going to find it in there. And he said, why not? And he said, that's Enochian language. And he said, what's that? And he said, it's a demon language. Get your shit and let's get out of here. And that's and so then he just they, they, they got their stuff together. I guess he did what he did. It's been years since I've, I've even listened to the story. But the guy that tells this story, I'm still in communication with uh, this experience for him he uh it, it scared him so bad that when he got out of the military he left the country he's still out of the country to this day um him and i have been trying to schedule a time for him to come back on and talk and hang out and stuff but it's kind of hard with the time difference <laughs> but um it, there's been there's been things like that that have happened throughout the years on my show and so when you say enochian magic that I'm assuming back then I was thinking like Enoch, Book of Enoch, and that's what he was trying to say. I'm assuming Enochian, is that the same thing is, or is it something different? Yeah, yeah, it is actually. It goes back to, um, and, and, and yeah, I think you, pr I don't know the pronunciations for sure. I, I, same thing. I read so many okay. books and, and I don't know how the pronunciations are, so I butcher them half the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it is pronounced Enochian, and then, but then it's, uh, then the vowel O is short. Enoch is how I've always heard it pronounced. So that's what I think it is. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it is all connected here. And that's why I was saying there's, there is a lineage you can trace back to the sort of beginning of the written record. And Enoch was the great grandfather to Noah. And I, I, 
I'm not the I'm not the smartest guy with the Bible, but I think he was one of two people. I think him and Methuselah were the only two that they didn't necessarily die, but they went up to be with God is mm-hmm. what the way the verses go. And some people say that that means he got abducted by a UFO or whatever. But the book of Enoch is is it's a subject I'm actually researching. Uh, I've got enough notes to do a show. I'm just waiting on a couple things to find time to dig into, but it goes um it goes back to what do you call uh pre diluvian so before the great flood uh but you know before noah is, is where enoch was around and in his book the book of enoch he talks about the idea of the watchers which you see in the book of genesis you see this idea that there were fallen angels called the watchers who fell from heaven and went down to earth and they procreated with women uh so you very much have this sort of Rosemary's baby slash Aleister Crowley moon child idea of the forbidden, uh, what do you call it? Like the forbidden copulation here of women with these fallen angels, these, these demonic spirits and the watchers, they procreated with the women and created a race uh, of giants called the Nephilim. And allegedly that's why, the flood happened because God saw all this and was appalled by it and, and did the great flood to wipe out this sort of forbidden, uh, you know, creation that happened. Well, Enoch, and I've seen, I've seen various things. Some people say Enoch is actually the spirit they call Metatron. And which I found interesting because the artist Santana, the musical artist Santana, he, talked about how he channeled Metatron and, and, and he played his guitar through Metatron. And then in um, Kendrick Lamar's, I don't remember which track it is. There's a, there's a track where he talks about talking to Metatron or something to that effect, but he does mention it, right? Um, as well as the LDS Mormons, they, who, you know, the LDS face started by Joseph Smith has a lot of connections with the Freemasons. That's what everybody talks about, you know, and I live in Utah, so I'm, I'm, you know, it's very heavily predominantly in the culture here, but, and you, and you'll see all the symbolism of the compass square and uh, like Saturn stones on the temple and things like that. But the more interesting element to the Joseph Smith LDS story here is the, um, the channeling of the entities, because again, just like we talked about with Alistair Crowley and Jack Parsons, they were able to successfully translate or, uh, uh, make contact with entities, Joseph Smith also made contact with an entity that's who dictated to him, uh, these golden tablets. Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not super intelligent on LDS faith, but, but he channeled an entity, oh, what the heck, Moroni, that's it. It was Moroni up in New York and they, and the LDS believe that Adam from the garden of Eden was ordained into the Melchizedek priesthood somehow through Enoch. And I don't know how the details work on that, but I do know that Joseph Smith making contact with this entity is also of interest to the occult. Uh, there's a guy named Damien Eccles who was infamously part of the West Memphis three, uh, back in the early two thousands and late nineties, there was several documentaries about the West Memphis three in Arkansas. And, the pitch put forth by the documentaries was that Damien Eccles and two of his buddies, when they were, I don't know, 17, 18 had murdered some young boys, one or I don't even remember a couple boys, one boy, I don't remember, but supposedly they, they had murdered this boy or multiple boys. And the, um, the, the accusation was that Damien Eccles was reading Alistair Crowley stuff and he wore black Metallica shirts. And then, you know, the town of Arkansas there, they condemned it because the, you know, satanic panic kind of stuff and the, the very sort of Christian leanings of the, the area. So these documentaries, they grabbed everyone's attention. A lot of, a lot of rockers when it came out and tried to support getting the, the West Memphis three out of, out of prison because they were convicted of murder and whether or not that happened, I don't know, wasn't there, but Jamie Nichols and, and the the other two accused would eventually be let out of prison on what they call an Alfred plea, where they would admit they did it, 
so that they can't sue the state, but they would let him out of prison for time served. So they took it, got out. I don't know if they were guilty or not. No clue. I've, I've read William Ramsey's book that puts together more evidence that suggests they did do it. But again, no idea. It could have, because I believe both things exist, right? I think that you could have Satan worshiping a cultist murder somebody. I also think that you could have innocent teenagers who don't fit into the local st- Christian structure and they get, you know, condemned for it. So both, both possibilities exist. Either way, Damien Nichols gets out of prison and he's been researching the occult heavily. And he posted about how he came to Utah and was very intrigued. I think he actually, I don't know if he, I don't know if he formally is announced as like an LDS Mormon, but he's had a lot of heavy leanings into it because of that, simply because Joseph Smith was able to make contact with this entity. So, um, Enoch is very important to all of these things because the book of Enoch talks about how these fallen angels, the watchers, not only did they procreate with the women, but they were teaching mankind all these forbidden practices of occultism that you see like ritual magic and all the things that the Bible tells you not to do, uh, you know, necromancy and talking to entities and even cannibalism shows up in the book of Enoch. Um, but but it, it it is important in the in the scheme of the occult and making contact simply because all of those things exist and you can read about them in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and then of course in the book of Enoch. But then John D was kind of the one who dictated and wrote down this language, the Enochian language in the fifteen, sixteen hundreds, that later on people would also have success in channeling entities basically that's wild that's wild um it really is it's a fascinating it's a fascinating story and i and i i you know this whole call realm it's uh i'm not an occultist i don't practice these things uh, I, they're fascinating though i mean it's it's it'll it'll make you go mad a little bit trying to research and understand all these things and and that's the way i feel too obviously i'm not an occultist i mean i'm, I'm very um outwardly spoken about my christian faith and uh I find this stuff fascinating, though. I, what we're talking about today to these monsters people are coming across in the woods that have ties to some really funky stuff. Uh, you mentioned about the, the 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 watchers. One thing that doesn't even it doesn't say this in the in Genesis, but again, I, I don't believe that the Bible is an all encompassing history of God and time and creation. I think it's just. Uh, a, a small sliver of what we were supposed to know. Uh, that was critical information. Uh, it took 66 books just to get that out. So imagine how big the book would be if <laughs> if we had everything. Uh, but I do think that there's, there's a probably strong likelihood that the Watchers could have possibly procreated with men as well, opposing themselves as women. They, they were shown throughout the Bible to be shapeshifters and be able to take on the form of man they're not men, but they were able to take the form as men, like in Lot, uh, and to the point that the people of the town thought that they were so attractive and that they wanted to have sexual intercourse with these men. And so, I mean, it, it's it's clear that they were able to go from angel to human very convincingly. Uh, and we know that they've been they've been they they procreated with human beings. So if they're going from something that's not human to go and create procreate with women why is it not possible for them to pose as women and have sex with men therefore possibly having the ability to give birth to hybrid super beings like nephilim that people will suggest would split a mom in half giving birth to so uh just just a thought that i think about sometimes probably totally off and i'm probably missing something so elementary and basic that blows that theory out the water Back on topic, though. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't even know if this is on topic, though, uh, but I'm going to bring it up because it, it, when you said it, it, it just kind of took me back a little bit. So I, I don't dive into this stuff like you do. I don't know nearly the, as much as you do. And, and just today, I, just because I knew I was going to be talking to you, so I was just kind of gathering some stuff that I had before and stuff, just trying to organize it all. Um, I came across a, a, a website that was sent to me. and 
the, to lay the background story on this, during episode 512, uh, De- Death Cult, uh, Desert Portal Death Cult, um, James talked about a lot of different things. He sent me images of you know him at this location, it, which is how I know where it's at because I was able to pull the coordinates off the image that he took on his iPhone. Uh, one of the other things he sent me, though, was an Instagram picture that was posted in Joshua Tree from this party. And on the picture was overlaid a symbol. And I have no idea what the symbol is. And actually, I have it queued up here. I, or I did. I'm going to text it to you right now so you have it as well so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. So just keep an eye on your phone here because it should come through in a, in a second here. Let me put Isaac. There we go. All right, send. So uh, it should be coming through here in a few, mi- few minutes for you. But uh, on this, this symbol here, I was like, well, I don't know what that is. And then a listener uh, saw the symbol when I posted it in the Discord, and they sent me a link here to Metatron's Cube. And I'm like, well, what the heck is Metatron's Cube? And uh, it, it, the, the, the symbol, I guess, for this, this Metatron's Cube looks not identical, but very similar to to this symbol in this picture that I just sent you. And in the description of this this cube, it just says, uh, a mystical three-dimension cube used by the archangel Metatron to watch over the flow of energy connecting Earth and the divine. And I'm like, all right, so we know that like during James's experience, it seemed like he was going through this interdimensional shift at times. And if this this Metatron's cube has anything to play with it, it, it I just found it very synchronistic maybe, is at, at the very least, that there could be a tie to this Metatron cube, which Metatron, an archangel, uh, watches over the flow of energy seemingly between realms. And I'm like, that's kind of trippy to me. I'll, I'll send you the link that I have here too. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the picture here. I definitely see the link you're talking about um, with the uh, the Metatron there. the The thing that I, that I see because because at first I thought this looks similar to the Philosopher's Stone in a way, but uh, more interestingly, I I see the uh, the Seal of Solomon, which is basically the Star of David. Uh, you know, and and, and it's a reference to the uh, the upright and the inverted triangle uh, posed on top of each other. Right, they're sort of interlocked and and the the point and i yeah, i'm just looking at this thing and i see a portal in the center my ma- my mind's kind of racing here right you see like a sort of portal in the center like it's sort of um let me let me write these down so i don't they don't miss it here so we got we got we got a ritual ritual magic circle we got the uh star of david which is um her- hermetic uh as above so below so let's let's talk about this here real quick just give you a little what my hot take is right off the jump here. So when you have the, the, the triangle, right. Um, in, in ritual magic, they call it the triangle of manifestation. And what the, what the magician will do is they'll stand inside of a circle. They'll perform these rituals. Kind of like we were talking about earlier, the, the amalantra working or even the Enochian magic. And when they, when the magician stands in the circle, they project the, the entity to manifest inside of a triangle. That's why they call it the triangle of manifestation. And the entity will be locked inside of that triangle and the magician will be safe inside of the circle. That's kind of the idea of what they, how they do it. So in this picture, I see a circle and I see a triangle, right? But when you see the two triangles overlapped like that, it also references the, the, the star of David or the seal of Solomon, and in terms of magic, you go back to King Solomon, and it was alleged that he used this, what they call the Seal of Solomon, uh, a ring to control entities. Um, some people say angels, some people say demons. He was able to control entities and make them do his bidding so that they would build his first temple. And 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 you see this storyline in Twin Peaks, which... Uh, all my listeners know I've been absolutely obsessed with Twin Peaks the last five, six months uh, because it fits into everything I've ever read and researched and understood about the occult. And um, it was my first time watching Twin Peaks, so I'm kind of blown away by it. But anyway, the uh, 
okay, so we talked about triangle manifestation, and you see that triangle of manifestation depicted as what they call the rock diamond in pop culture. Jay Z, Rihanna, and the, and the, you know they interlock their hands and, and form a triangle. And originally, it goes back to Jay Z who who had Rockefeller Records, and he says, "Oh, it's a diamond." Which sure, yeah, if you if you press your thumbs hard and you and you angle it, it is a diamond. But the way they do it, it kind of looks more like a triangle, and that sort of caught on in pop culture into this sort of Illuminati accusation stuff. And it is interesting that that him and Beyonce and Rihanna just did it at the Super Bowl, which ironically, the I watched the Super Bowl live, and when she did that hand gesture of the the rock diamond or the triangle of manifestation, the cameras they cut away for that exact like two seconds. And they, 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 they resumed in, she, she raises her hands and it cuts away. So you don't see it. Then it cuts right back in on her after she's done with it. And you could see it on the YouTube version of the performance. Cause someone sent it to me cause I watched it live on TV and I, you know, I had my stuff to say about her. Then someone sent me the, the YouTube thing. I said, what? Like that wasn't on the TV performance. So if you watch the YouTube, you can see it. Uh, but the idea is that these, these artists, are using occult practices to manifest energy, to get attention, to uh, sort of put themselves in the position of gods to their fans in a way. Are they really doing it? I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. I don't know what goes on in these inner circles, but I do know these artists get into some weird stuff. Like when, like, you know, Santana's talking about how he channels Metatron. Like, that's kind of weird stuff. Normal people don't talk like that. Right. <laughs> so, so, anyways, this triangle manifestation has a rich history, right? Um, but yeah, that star of David Seal of Solomon, it has the inverted and the upright triangle, and it's a reference to alchemy. And there's a there's a long again, this is another multi hour explanation but i'll give you the short version back in ancient egypt it was said that they you know back in ancient egypt and, and ancient greece they talked about it, they talked to all these gods and stuff and people think oh that's just kind of silly stuff and that's you know thousands of years ago that's how they talked well there's a theory that that wasn't silly and that was real stuff they were really talking to gods and they talked to this one called thoth or hermes trismegistus uh, which means hermes the the thrice great and hermes very similar to the story of the book of Enoch was this God who came to earth and told mankind, Hey, there's these occult practices you can use to defy God and you can sort of bend reality to your will. You can become a magician. And in this teaching that they now, they call alchemy. Um, he, it was dictated on the book of Thoth, which people say is the emerald tablets that's all again massive sort of rabbit hole stuff but one main principle that you'll find in what they call the hermetic wisdom which again references hermes or this thoth god is as above so below which says that magic is possible meaning here on earth in the microcosm if i employ these occult practices i can actually become god in a way and have an effect on the cosmos and the universe and the universe can if i used enough energy and manifestation the universe will sort of bend itself to my will and create reality and a lot of and you'll see this a lot in new age thinking you'll see it in uh, i in fact i was reading a book about how to manifest wealth as someone had sent me they said oh you got to read this book and and it's interesting stuff and you know, I'd be lying if I say some of this stuff doesn't work in a way. Like an example I always give is years and years and years ago, I was in college studying physics and I was studying quantum physics at the time because my background's engineering. And we talked a lot about different wacky ideas in quantum physics, like the law of entanglement and things like that. And at the same time, the movies, what the bleep do we know came out? These were documentaries that were very new age quantum physics thinking. And, and, you know, and they're uplifting. Honestly, it's, it's, it's nice to feel like you've got maybe some level of control over your life. Uh, and there's positive elements you could take from that. Uh, but anyway, there's one concept I had read, I was into new age thought for a while there. And one concept they said is to just say yes to everything. And cause I was a really negative person. I'm still pretty negative. Let's be honest, but I used to be really negative and, and, and isolating and stuff. And 
you know, I, for a year, they said, just say yes to everything. And I did that and it opened up a lot of doors for me. So I do think there's something to be said for trying to get your mind right. And, you know, for Christians, that can be prayer and going to church. And maybe that's enough for other people who, like me that I'm a Christian. I'm very skeptical still. It's it's not an easy subject for me to cover. Uh, but ultimately, I do believe in, in in sort of white light, power of Christ kind of things and love and all those things, right? Uh, so I, I am a Christian. I, I'm Orthodox, actually. I'm an Ortho bro. They say Ortho bro. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, there's a lot of Ortho bros. Jay Dyer's an Ortho bro, apparently, and you know, uh, there's a lot of Ortho. There's a, there's a weird pipeline in the realm of conspiracy. I actually started out in the realm of conspiracy. That was my my podcast. The original name was Conspiracy Theories in Unpopular Culture. Uh, back in 2014, I started it, and consp- the realm of conspiracy theories has changed pretty dramatically over the last few years and i changed the title of my show to occult symbolism and pop culture because that's more fitting of what my my lane is that i stick to uh whereas conspiracy has sort of taken on this really politicized sort of subversive dangerous element more so than in the past and i was just like oh boy this is it's just not the there's a lot of conspiracy people that stick around with me because they like hearing about occult symbolism they find in films and and there's a heavy overlap between my research and conspiracy theories but uh anyway i forget where i was going with all that but the point is the that symbol i see a lot of hermetic wisdom ideas in there with as above so below well that's fascinating I I, I, yeah. I don't know where you were going either, but I was in it for the ride, man. I was like, keep going. This is great stuff. Uh, and, and now I, I had a thought running through my head and it's gone now too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that 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 symbol, just the, the Metatron and all that stuff, I, I had never heard of Metatron. And so the symbol kind of stood out to me and uh, it kind of, we, we could probably migrate into something else here that I, I had texted you about when I saw it on your Instagram a couple of months ago. Uh, you posted a clip, and I don't know if it's from Twin Peaks or something else, but there was a guy sitting at a table with a woman, and he opens up a piece of paper that had a like a symbol on it, almost like a sigil or something. And he talks about how symbols are gateways. And then she kind of cuts him off and stuff, and they they, they change the subject because he's like, oh, you got nothing to worry about, dear, kind of thing. Like he was holding something back. Uh, are, are symbols being gateways? Gateways to what? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you heard the episode uh, with Joshua Tree and the portal idea. I talk about portals a lot on my show. There's there's more and more people coming forward talking about their experiences with uh, portal-like uh, situations, whether they just saw something walk walk out seemingly of a portal where they don't see the portal, but it's just like this thing appeared, like it walked out of something to actually seeing portals appear and things going in and out of them. Uh, so how do symbols possibly play into this idea of gateways and what are gateways? Great, great topic. Uh, th- this, there's a lot to this. I'll try to sort of keep it. I'm watching the clock here. I'll, I'll try to keep it. it. We might close out the show on this because there's a lot to say. <laughs> okay. uh, real quick, though, one last thing on this picture you sent me. I don't know what the how it has those circles, the the two D's and the J, I have no idea what that means. Um, when I look at that, I see the Kabbalistic tree of life, Sephirot is what they're called, but no clue. But more importantly, the caption there, it says, can I read the caption on, on the show here? Is that okay? Yeah, yep. Okay. It says, it says, don't worry about falling. The dust will catch you. And then it has a, f- uh, emoji of a ladder, right? Now that ladder is symbolic of Freemasonry. That's that's a they use the ladder oftentimes in many Freemasonic uh, iconography and symbolism uh, to to represent the the initiate climbing the ladder to ascending to getting the hidden gnosis, the hidden knowledge at the top of the you know thirty third degree Freemason, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, uh, which is really fascinating. I, in fact, I wrote a book and I talk about Stanley Kubrick obsessively. Uh, I wrote a whole book about Kubrick stuff and in the shining, when you watch the shining, there's, there's ladders everywhere. It is really bizarre. They'll have ladders going to nowhere. Um, it's really weird, but anyway, hmm. uh, the, the, when I see the ladder, that's a, a Freemasonic symbol. I don't know if that's what it's intended to be there. I, I certainly don't understand how that fits into the caption. Seems weird to me. 
Yeah. Uh, but it, it tells me that maybe there was some kind of initiatory event going on. Like we, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, the desert's the initiatory place. Maybe this was a, an initiation ritual for somebody. And that's the hidden sort of language that symbol they're using. That's why. Uh, anyway. anyway uh, to, so let's talk about symbols and portals and that kind of stuff. If, if you recall, there was a, in Switzerland, the Goddard tunnel had opened years ago. Do you remember this when they did this huge, it was a huge to do. Every conspiracy theorist was yeah. losing their mind about it. And rightfully so. And it was a lot of like weird demonic pagan looking stuff. Um, but it seemed like they were just, they were drilling a hole through the tunnel, but it did seem like it was more of a, a ritual about a portal. Like, like with CERN, people say CERN is opening portals and, uh, you know, I, I don't doubt that stuff. I, <laughs> It seems like maybe that's a thing, and, and if people watch Twin Peaks, they'll they'll know that all this stuff is very much in the show, right? Okay, so that itself just sold me on checking out Twin Peaks myself. The people listening to the show, <laughs> so like you and I are like uh, vinegar and oil at, on certain things. Like I don't watch movies, I don't watch TV shows. I'm known for it. People, like you said to me, "Have you seen Twin Peaks?" I'm like, "Absolutely not." But now I gotta check it out because uh, you're talking portals to me. I'm in. I'm in for the ride. Let's do it. Uh, let me let me clarify because okay let me take take five minutes on the twin peaks soapbox That's and we'll get fun. back to symbols <laughs> uh for years and years since like i said i started blogging in 2011 and writing books around that time podcasting in 2014 without fail nonstop. people say have you watched twin peaks you gotta watch twin peaks and over the years i tried many many times i watched half of the first episode probably five six seven times before i finally made it through because when you watch it, it's from 1990, the first two seasons, it was 90 and 91. When you watch it, it it just seems like a silly, uh, weirdly paced soap opera. And I'm watching, I'm like, what's there for me? Why are they telling me to watch this? I don't even understand. And they, they won't tell you why exactly, because that's of part of the fun is trying to decode what's happening. And I, in October, I got really sick. This In 22, I got really sick. And I, I gave it one more shot. I was like, okay, let me try this Twin Peaks thing again, right? And I make it through the first episode. It's fine, whatever. And I'm on like the fourth or fifth episode, and I'm still fighting it. I'm like, this is stupid. Why am I watching this? And and then, you know, then something will happen. You'll be like, oh, that's interesting. I'm not going to plot spoil in case you do watch it. Uh, but let me tell you this. When you watch, it's about 50 hours to watch the first two seasons, the film, and then season three. And I watched the whole thing, and then I read the books afterwards. But when I watched all that content, I wanted to bail on the project at least five to ten times, where I was like, this is so stupid. I'm going back to watching what I want to watch. Uh, but I stuck with it, and it was worth it, because by the end of the whole thing, even though I was very confused by a lot of stuff and a lot of things didn't make sense. And there's a lot of silly parts and, you know, David Lynch is kind of a weirdo. So there's weird pacing sometimes. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I, I don't know if I'd watch it all again, but let me read the books. Then I read the books and then the books is where they really unload all the occult connections. And I think, Oh my God, like it all makes sense. And Part of the storyline, and this won't, this isn't going to spoil anything, but part of the storyline is the idea that there is a doorway to another realm. And, and, uh, I don't know the quote off the top of my head, but there's, uh, one of the characters makes mention to how love can enter a place of light and fear can enter a place of darkness. And that's very much in line with the idea of symbols and this idea you're talking about with portals. I did a show, I did a deep dive on this satanic group called the Order of Nine Angles. I'm going to read you uh, two sentences from the book that I think sum it up as best as I could find over my years of researching symbolism and uh, why this happens, okay? It says, the magician utilizes signs and symbols as part of a communication process with the phenomenon she wishes to understand or affect and assigns meaning to the phenomena that became known to her. Okay, so so basically it's saying that people that believe in the idea of doing ritual magic or occult magic, uh, again, to put this into perspective, like the Book of Enoch tells us the fallen angels was teaching mankind, and that's why God smited the world, right? These forbidden uh, arts. The magician will use signs and symbols to communicate with this unseen realm. 
that's the idea behind it. Okay. Then they talk about sigils and a sigil is basically just a sort of refined personalized symbol uh, in a way. Okay. It says sigils need to be properly implanted into the subconscious as part of creating a necessary space between action and the ability of the sigil to continue to work below the level of conscious thought. And they're referencing some actual science there. If you, if you research Carl Jung, a famous psychoanalyst and occult Gnostic, he was studying a lot of the occult phenomena. He wrote a whole book on UFOs back in like, I don't know, the 1940s or whatever. And he talked about uh, symbols giving purpose to man. And a lot of these ancient occultists knew all this. And, and it was very common knowledge, apparently, back in the day, how uh, symbols held a certain power. And that's why you know Hitler was obsessed with the occult as well. More like his right-hand man, he uh, Heinrich Himmler, was deep into it. And I think Hitler was maybe casually interested. Maybe he was more into, into power. But... Either way, that's why they took the solar symbol of the swastika, uh, which was a, a, a positive symbol for, I don't know, all of history, and they reversed its uh, orientation to make it draw upon negative dark forces. Uh, but and, 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 and in their early, the early parades when they were getting the hyping up the German people before all the atrocities, they would put together these large shows where they would have 30,000 swastikas. And there was a reason for that. They were sort of soaking the, the, the mass consciousness of the people with this symbol. And, you know, I, there's no, I don't, I don't know if there's a hard proof you can have. I think there's gotta be a little bit of belief that this is what goes on. I've read enough and I've seen enough that it, to me, I, I believe it wholeheartedly. I think that uh, a lot of these, a lot of these occultists will use, symbols in the in the entertainment in the films and in the tv shows and just like that quote was saying it creates space for action to happen and i and to put it back to twin peaks that's kind of what i think twin peaks was able to do now that i've digested the whole thing because it was created by david lynch and mark frost and mark frost wrote the books that to me reveal i don't know 70 percent of the truth of what's going on here with the connections to the occult i think you need um <laughs> i don't want to say it myself you need a translator no but you need you need to know a little bit more than what the books say to really put it in perspective to understand why this show was so i don't know if important is the right word so powerful well david lynch I don't know that he was the guy who knew all about the occult symbolism, but Mark Frost did. Mark Frost understood the occult ideas and David Lynch, he was the, a really great director and he, he's able to speak to the subconscious. So I think those two combined together, it was the occult knowledge with Lynch's ability to speak to the subconscious that made it really powerful. And that's sort of proven because this show, once you get into it, you'll find there's this massive cult following people just completely obsessed with the show. And I, I couldn't believe it myself, but I got sucked into it too. And, and I'm completely obsessed with the show. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, <laughs> cause I watch a lot of horror movies. I haven't been able to watch a new movie. Every time I sit down, I'll get 15 minutes into a movie. And I'm like, man, I think I'd rather watch twin peaks and I'll rewatch it. Cause I'm looking for clues and evidence and things like that. But yeah, the, the, to put a bow on it. Yeah. The, there's a power in symbolism and there's something weird that happened in pop culture over the last five, six, seven, eight years where we were talking about symbols and talking about who's in the Illuminati for years. You know, I was, I was on that, that, that group of folks and from, you know, 2011 to 2015 and 16, uh, pointing out symbols and artists doing it in their videos and things like that. And there's, it got popularized and sort of made to be a joke in a way is how I interpret it. Like you'll see memes of people, uh, for instance, I'm trying to think, I don't watch sports, but I think it was Tom Brady. And, you know, there's a meme of, of, of him with like a triangle 
shaped thing on his i don't remember on his hat or something and they're like oh illuminati confirmed you know and like it's kind of been made a joke yeah and it dismisses the actual reality of what i think is going on and a lot of folks too it's not just me but um reality of the uh the ability for these magicians to speak to the subconscious so uh these symbols and the i guess the gateways to these sim- with these symbols a lot of it is through the subconscious is what you would say yeah there's there's um there's some uh there's a guy named peter lavenda who's a very intelligent writer on the occult and in one of his books called the dark lord he speaks about this other magician named kenneth grant he basically was a follower of crowley and very much into all the same things we've been talking about and kenneth grant was exploring this hidden realm that they call the mauve zone and these occultists believe that um there's a source of what he calls the artistic impulses as well as divine and demonic forces that comes from the mauve zone and the entrance to this mauve zone allegedly is through the um the uh the subconscious of the mind uh, so it's very much a sort of woo wooey idea that's not an actual place but um the the shadow the shadow realm of the mind is where the symbols speak to and allegedly that's where you know Carl Jung talked about this is in fact where creativity exists is in the shadow of the subconscious so you'll see a lot of artists seemingly trying to access the shadow realm uh one example i like to give because I, I know these are really weird topics for people who aren't familiar uh kobe bryant when he died and again i'm not i don't watch sports i couldn't even tell you what team he played for i think it was the lakers if i was to guess but anyway kobe bryant he died in i think it was january of 2020 it was right before the pandemic and it was a huge topic, right? Obviously, famous celebrity young guy dies in this tragic helicopter accident. Well, a lot of conspiracies came out at the time. There was a cartoon, I, a strangely, a cartoon where he, Kobe Bryant's cartoon character dies in a helicopter crash, which is really bizarre. I mean, it happened, right? And and stuff like that happens. And I, I my mind automatically goes to this idea of creating reality and you put enough energy and attention into these things that there's a possibility they exi- they can happen, which is why, and it sounds, it's borderline paranoia, but I, I get, I get kind of, uh, uh, scared to, to say or do things that, that I think could give things energy that I don't want to happen. Right. But anyway, Kobe Bryant, he was in the process of creating this multimedia company called Granity Entertainment. And I was researching it and he had released some kids books. He had planned this line of children's books meant to sort of inspire kids to, you know, uh, very Disney esque, use your imagination, use magic and things like that. And that's what Granity means in this universe. He created in his books. Uh, Granity means magic. And a lot of people would probably dismiss it and say, oh, it's just like Disney, right? It's like everything's magical and it's it's not meant to be this occult Enochian talking to demon stuff you're always ranting and raving about. It's something different, right? And I get that. Uh, You know, there's space for that to exist where I'm like, yeah, you're right. Sometimes we get a little overzealous in this realm. But if you read the books, I I I did a show reviewing two of the books that he had released before his death that I I read both of them. Uh, so I don't remember which one was which, but themes you found in the books, there was both of them were about children who wanted to become better at sports, right? And in the one book, the kid uh, channels this flame entity that later, by the end of the book, she finds out it was a fallen angel, basically Lucifer, is what she finds out. Are you serious? I'm dead serious, man. I did a show about it. I'll send you the link to it. I did a show about it and I and I walk through and, and read right from the book. Um, but yeah, she finds out because she she sort of I don't know, channels something from this entity and she becomes great at basketball. Then at the end of the book, she walks into the room and I think it was her uncle was worshiping this statue. And he explains to her about how it was this sort of fallen angel 
<laughs> and then, so that's one thing. And then the other book talked about how this boy was in this training camp and it took a bunch of boys and was teaching them how to be better at basketball. And in the training camp, they go through a variety of magical uh, ritual initiation steps. And one of them involves making contact with their shadow self. And this one boy gets really good at making contact and letting the shadow self take over his physical body. And it scares him because he almost kills one of his buddies playing basketball. He was so competitive because he let the dark side take over. And, you know, this fits into all this talk. And he uses those terms, the shadow, which uh, I've read all this stuff from Carl Jung and Peter Lavenda with the Dark Lord and all these actual occultists who have been talking about embracing the shadow and letting the shadow realm take over. And then, and I'm blown away by all this. I'm like, wow, these are in the kids books. But then, um, but then, uh, someone alerted me to, I guess, Kobe Bryant uses this, uh, alter ego called dark Mamba or something like that. Yeah. And there was a video clip of him on, I think it was Sesame street. There was a puppet or something. And he, is talking about using the shadow to allow himself to be better at basketball and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's wild. Uh, but, but that's all the stuff that makes me think all the time that, man, we have to really take a look at all these artists and celebrities who are, who are, or, you know, Beyonce is using the triangle and she's talking about how she lets the spirit Sasha fierce run through her body. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to sort of put a conclusion on it, I, I try not to insert my personal opinion into a lot of things, but I, but I do like to throw a bone because I, you know, sometimes we get a little overzealous and we start um, looking into things too much and thinking too much about things. And and I'm I'm trying to find that balance is where I'm at in my personal journey of all understanding all this because I see that there are connections here, and a lot of people have, been, especially the mainstream media and uh, a lot of the powers that be, they want us to believe that this is all some kind of quasi satanic panic thing. And I get that. I get that there's an element of that here, especially with the way people run with this stuff. Um, but I also want to raise awareness of it and say like, look, like let's just, let's just be smart about it. I think they're trying to do a sort of revelation of the method and get people in a way on board with some of these ideas or something to that effect, you know, but it's definitely yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they know people are going to run with it, like this whole satanic panic uh, energy. And so they use that to cover what they're actually doing. Uh, the Black Mamba and then the this, this shadow figure in the, in, in the story, stories for these kids. I had no idea about it. I have to look into this now, too, because I'm, I'm very interested in it because... Uh, I had, I, 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 there's so many things that have gone around with this idea of Kobe Bryant dying. I remember seeing the, the cartoon that you were talking about. Uh, but, uh, well, tell me your thoughts about LeBron James. No, I'm just kidding. We're, we're not even going to go there right now. We're not even going to go there right now. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's definitely illuminate confirmed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell me about it. Uh, no, but I, I, I brought up that whole thing, the, the subconsciousness, because, um, I did an episode, I think it was 512, to be honest with you. I think uh, it was 512. There, there was a guy named Hunter on my show who uh, thought he had a dream of an upright walking dog that he saw in this dream realm, dream state, and it started going towards his family. He stepped in between the two. He got mauled. He wakes up st sitting up in his bed. He's got bruises on his body. And you could say, well, that, that could be, you know, he did it in his sleep, you know, nightmare. That's fine. He tells his wife the dream, and uh, a few days later, he's out in the woods with his son walking through the woods, his 11-year-old son here in Tennessee where I'm at, and uh, they both lock eyes with an upright walking dog that looked identical to what he saw in his dream. And so th that's why I, I, and I don't know, I, and I had to ask him if the, he came across any kind of symbolism that he's been diving into or something like that, I don't know, but the subconsciousness, the, the, the consciousness level is it that his consciousness manifested in this physical reality what he dreamt about because it scarred him so bad? Or is there more to this where uh, our mind, our consciousness could be a gateway in itself to other realms? And if that's the case and we go to other places, could, if we don't close that gateway properly, things come through? It's weird because like, it's like, what, did a dog man 
peek through his forehead and come out. I, I have no idea, but uh, that was his experience. And uh, he, I think him and I have been talking about having him come out to my studio to sit down and talk again. Uh, but I would love to do it if it's possible with him and his son to have his son come and talk about this experience too. Uh, but um, that's kind of why I brought it up. Uh, to wrap this up, though, let people know where they can find you. Promote away. I know your Instagram is popping. I, I was just on it this this uh, this morning, and I think it had like fifty seven thousand followers. I'm like, dang, boy. Uh, so, what, 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 where can people find your work? Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, so my Instagram is at Isaac Weishop. Try your best spelling that. Uh, but if you want to, you know, if you go to my website, IlluminatiWatcher.com, I got links to everything. Uh, if you don't want to do that and you want to just go straight to the podcast, that's kind of my my. You know, I've, I've written a bunch of books on Amazon, narrated them on Audible as well. You can find them under my name. But the podcast is called Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. Occult is spelled O-C-C-U-L-T. And uh, you can find my show on there. And I do you know, shows weekly. And I'm just starting this uh, journey into Twin Peaks. So if you're a Twin Peaks fan, this is definitely a great time to get on board. Uh, and, and just like you're talking about the woods, man, it's it's a huge part of Twin Peaks. Uh <sighs> It's not a plot spoiler, but anyway, I, and, I, and I'm, t- I'm trying to gas you up on this because you're probably going to watch it and you're probably going to think this is stupid, especially because you're not a movie or a TV guy. <laughs> it's going to be a struggle. You're going to really hate it. You got to really work for it. But, um, you know, the first time through, you're going to have your doubts and then you're going to think about it. And you're going to say, oh, man, that's wild. And then, you, you know, you're going to be like me and rewatching this stupid thing. But uh, yeah, anyways, I, I'm, I'm going I'm deep diving super deep and heavy into Twin Peaks, but yeah, you can get you can get the podcast where uh, I talk about a lot of pop culture things and uh, the books. I've got a book called The Dark Path, which is what the book I tell people to start with because I wrote that in 2017, and it it sums up the whole agenda, you know, from my perspective, and it 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 encapsulates nicely what I think is happening. And the reason I push it is because since I've written it things have just become more true and, and and i'm more convinced that i'm like dude I, I i think this is it i think this is like the grand theory of what's happening and why and how symbolism works and and all this stuff so yeah i'm i'm, I'm all over the place so you know check it out definitely check it out i actually have that book the dark path haven't read it yet but i do have it uh right and uh, i i i what i do is whenever i see a book that i'm like oh that might be banned one day i buy them and uh oh, I, yes and I, and I do believe uh this book could be on that list yeah i you know i i've written nine books with very dangerous sounding titles uh, because they used to not ban you right and i wrote a book ironically i won't say the term on here in 2020 i wrote a book because i was I was researching heavily into, uh, and you can read between the lines, health matters of what was happening around then. And I wrote a book about something related to that, and it got banned from Amazon. I said, wow, really? You're telling me I got all these books about worshiping Satan and channeling aliens, and that's totally fine, but then I write this one? But anyway, um, and not that I have, you know, I I stay out of people's health, man. I think everyone should make their own decisions on that kind of stuff for what it's worth. But anyway, um, yeah, the dark path is, is definitely the book that if you're going to read one book, that's the one that I wrote that I think holds up really well. Awesome. Well, everybody should check them out. Uh, Isaac, I appreciate you joining me. It's been a long time. Uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Cheers, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) 